Hello, I'm here today with a very special guest, Father Benedict Keeley, who's the founder of Nazarene.org. Father Benedict, welcome to Walsingham. Thank you, Kevin. Nazarene.org, what's that about? Nazarene.org is a charity mainly aiding and advocating for persecuted Christians, but especially in the Middle East, which I've visited multiple times since ISIS started in 2014. When you say the Middle East, people think of a kind of block of countries. Is, is, there, is there a way in which you can differentiate the persecution within those countries? Are there certain countries where there's worse persecution than in others? Yes, I like to call the Middle East actually the Holy Land. When, when we Christians talk about the Holy Land, we tend to focus on Israel, Palestine, but actually if you think about it, the Holy Land is Egypt because our Lord and Our Lady and Saint Joseph went to Egypt, that's Holy Land, Lebanon, Syria, these are places where our Lord walked and even into Iraq his disciples, his apostles walked and so the whole Middle East in many ways, uh, those specific countries are, are holy, they're sacred ground and they're also holy from, from the Old Testament of course but in different countries as we know there's been different levels of persecution from ISIS, from Al Qaeda, uh, the soft persecution and then heated up persecution it tends to go in sort of in waves. The other thing which during my lifetime in the Middle East is synonymous with war uh, there have been many wars, wars between Israel and its neighbours on, on various occasions, but there's also been wars in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. Um, is that, is that the, the stimulus for the persecution? Is it coming out of those war-torn conflicts, or is there something more endemic in the Middle East which is persecuting the Christian inhabitants? That's a very difficult question. I remember when I went to Iraq for the first time in 2015, early 2015, just a few months after ISIS had pushed all the Christians out of their uh, area in the, in the Nineveh plain of Iraq. Uh, one thing uh, the person who helped me there said was, you have to leave all your preconceptions behind. It's, it's very, very complicated. So anyone who sort of can give you an answer and say it's because of this or that reason, it's so complicated. You're looking at thousands of years of history, but you're particularly looking, of course, at the very long battle between Christianity and Islam. It's not politically correct to say it, but that is the reality. It's been a long battle between Christianity and Islam since, since the time of Muhammad. So with the rise of radical Islam in the last 20 or 30 years, would you say that that has been the stimulus for the persecution of Christians? Absolutely, and that's across the globe. It's not just the Middle East now. We're moving into a genocide in Africa and Nigeria, uh, of course we're looking, it's across the world, we think of France, even in France Father Jacques Hamel is martyred in, in a church in Normandy, I mean there's almost not a country in the world where you can't say Christians are being persecuted and it's not just by Islam but unfortunately uh, radical Islam is one of the main causes of persecution of Christians. Now you're an Englishman Father Benedict, uh, your charity is domiciled in the United States um, how did you get into this, this particular interest? Well, we're in Walsingham, this wonderful place dedicated to Our Lady, and I say with absolute sincerity that Our Lady inspired this. I was, uh, 2014, August 2014, ISIS, if the viewers and listeners remember, ISIS had swept across the Nineveh plain of, of Iraq. The Nineveh plain, we know from our scriptures, is where Jonah preached, the prophet Jonah, Mosul, the city of Mosul in Iraq, is Nineveh. I've been there, I've been to the tomb of Jonah, Isis blew the tomb up. Uh, and I was praying, I heard for the first time in 2014, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, there was going to be no mass in Mosul because the Christians had been driven out, who'd been there from the beginning. And I was just thinking how awful this was, I was saying my rosary, and thinking, well, what can we do? What can we do? And so it just came to me very simply that um, ISIS marked the houses of Christians with the Arabic N, the Nun it's called. It's a, like a half circle, half moon with a dot. And it's the Arabic word for N, Nazarani, Nazarian. That's why my charity is called Nazarian. Uh, and it's actually an ancient sign. It's been used. It wasn't ISIS that invented it. And so what we did, we started to produce those rubber bracelets that a lot of the kids wore a few years ago that various charities marked with that sign so we could sell them, we could, people could remember to pray if they were wearing it, and then um, we could give a little bit of money. And that developed through 
to lapel pins, to car magnets, and the great EWTN host Raymond Arroyo actually invited me on his show very early on in September of 2014 when we kind of launched. And so from then on, it just blossomed into then my priesthood speaking more and more about um, the persecuted and, and we're, we're here now. It's one thing having a, a concern about persecuted Christians, which all Christians should have, and praying for them and, and trying to help them maybe in financial or practical ways, but it's another leap to start a worldwide charity, which you have done. I mean, we already have a number of charities dealing with this, so what, what's the particular focus of Nazarene.org? Well, you're very kind to call it a worldwide charity. It's really just me. Uh, I, I, my job as a priest is advocacy, and I always say aid and advocacy are equally important. Sometimes people can say, well, who are you helping? Oh, and by the way, you, yes, you speak about it as well. Aid and advocacy are equally important. So my job as a priest, and there are not many priests doing it, and I may be the only one in the English language, is to speak, write, preach, talk, doing exactly what I'm doing now, uh, about the persecuted, to keep it in the minds and hearts of Christians, because you said we should be thinking about them, but unfortunately even many good practicing Catholics and Christians are not thinking about the persecuted, maybe not for their own fault. So that's the first part of the charity. The second part is very specific, it's very small, we're believers in small is beautiful. What we do is we try and give mini, mi mini microfinancing loans to families, to businesses, for example, in Iraq and Syria, we give $5,000, which is a very small amount of money, and that can start a family business. It's enough money to start a small business. So, for example, we have uh, a man uh, who has a taxi. He was in one of the cities in, in Iraq. His taxi, his old taxi, was so old and he had no air conditioning. It gets to 120 degrees in Iraq. So the poor man, he had no business. So we bought him a taxi. Now he's up and running, he can support his family, and they stay. That's the other critical factor. You don't just dole out money to do nothing. We give the money, they start a business, and then they have an incentive to stay in their own country, which is very important. So we're actually trying to help people not pour across various borders into other countries to stay in their own country. I mean, this, this is key to the current debate, I mean, because the Christian presence, as you say, has been there for over 2,000 years, and the, the ISIS and other groups want to eradicate that presence in, in not just its, its, its the people, but its visible forms. Um, when somebody has been forcibly removed to another land, and we have refugee camps scattered throughout the Middle East, it's very difficult, is it not, to try to coax those people back to a situation which they may have fled in terror from. They, they need two things. One I can't do anything about except with the advocacy. They need security and they need jobs. Those two things are essential. At the moment the critical problem is both. They, they have neither in, in many of these places, but at least if we can provide them with jobs, with an incentive to stay, then security is the other factor. But yes, if, there's, if neither of those things are there, then they won't stay and they'll never come back either. Uh, they need that stability and it, it's, it's critical. Have you visited the refugee camps? Well, yes, when I first went to Iraq, uh, they were all driven out. They were in refugee camps. 100, 120,000 had been driven out of their ancestral homes in, on the Nineveh Plain, as I said, and were living initially. This is August of 2014, where it's 110, 120 degrees. They were driven out overnight, Feast of the Transfiguration, actually, overnight by ISIS and had to be, how, well, they weren't housed, they were in the streets, lying in the streets, in the Archdiocese of Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan. Then they moved into tents. By the time I got there in May of 2015, which was only, as I say, a few months later, they were put in what they called containers. They were effectively sort of shipping containers, families, eight people, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, and children, in a shipping container. Then they moved finally into, many of them, into, into some kind of housing. Um, but it was, it's, it's a shocking thing to think of. Most of us can identify, these are people just like us. They had jobs like us, they were businessmen, women, and the, you're living in a shipping container in, in, in 120 degree heat. It was extraordinary. How, how, do you, how do you keep your sort of balance in that situation? Because seeing that sort of suffering on that scale, and suffering because of being a Christian, 
How, how do you, how do you, resp I mean, as a human being and as a priest, how do you respond to that? How do you, how do you manage to not just throw your hands in despair and say, this is awful, I can do nothing? Well, bizarrely, it's very inspiring in many ways. Every time I've been to Iraq or Syria, which I've been to now once, is, is an inspiration because you see people who love their faith, who will not deny their faith, who will in fact lose everything for their faith. And when I say everything, I mean everything down to the virtually the clothes they're wearing, that they've given everything for their faith. And so I've always come back inspired. And they're not perfect people, they're just like us. They have many faults and failings, but that's a, such a factor for us in the West to see. We've been rather, we've got, allowed ourselves to get, up, get blasé about our faith and to be a little shallow, perhaps a little lukewarm. And these people just, they, they remind you that this, what's more important than the faith. There's, even life itself is not more important. Do you see a bigger picture here then that, that there's a way in which they are teaching us something in the West? They are very much teaching us. They're preaching to us about the importance of the faith as everything I just said. We've, been, we've become lukewarm, we've been willing to deny. We are not being persecuted to the point of death yet, but we are certainly being told to hide our religion, to keep religion behind closed doors, to keep it within the confines of the church, not to bring it into the public square. And that's the inspiration that, that the persecuted give us, to not be, um, not be scared of the faith. In fact, to be proud and happy about the faith. That's what we need. We need people who are happy about being Catholic Christians and, and, and to promote that. Persecution in the West has, has come and gone and, and in various phases. Um, certainly here in England, uh, we're sitting in Walsingham where there, there's evidence around us of, of the Reformation and the, the beginning of the persecution of the Catholic faith, which certainly in various forms continued for at least another 200, 300 years. We've got the ruins of the Priory just behind us here, and we've also got the Martyr's Field on the other side here. But it's probably fair to say that for most Christians in the British Isles and certainly maybe in Western Europe, their memory of persecution is, is, is very limited or, or confined to storybooks you know, of, of the early Christian martyrs, for example, in Rome. So when they hear of the persecuted Christians in the Middle East, um, it, can, it can sort of fit into a historical mode which doesn't really mean a lot. And I'm just wondering if you can give us, Father Benedict, a, 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 as graphic an example as you can of what, how this persecution manifests itself today in the, in the 21st century? Well, I would first say uh, it may be a memory, but it's a memory that's getting a lot closer. We know that there are increasing attacks now in Western Europe, in the United States on buildings. It's not long from moving from the building to the person, and attacks on, the, on persons are, are beginning as well. So the memory, unfortunately, is coming a lot closer. I remember once when I was in Iraq early on, I was telling one of the priests who actually, it was from Mosul, and he, he had his 800-year-old church was an ISIS torture center. That's one of the things ISIS did, by the way. They used churches specifically as torture centers. The sacrilege is unbelievable. But his 800-year-old church was a torture center, and his house had been taken by his neighbors. And I was saying, well, you know, we're getting persecution here in the West as well. And he, it was a good correction because he said, you haven't had your head cut off. I said, yes, you're right, Father, not yet, but it's true, it's, it's increasing. A graphic example, and it is very graphic, I was told a story by a person who had just spoken to this lady. ISIS came into the house, a young couple, husband and wife and baby. ISIS said, which they always did, deny Christ. They always want to, it's, it's, it's always theological. They want Christ to be denied, deny Christ. And the couple said, no, no, we, we love Jesus. We will not deny Christ. Isis grabbed the baby and killed the baby right there and then and took the husband away and the wife, the widow, she's probably a widow, said, I don't know where my husband is now. He's probably dead. So it's extremely graphic, but that's the, that's the reality. And that's what happened, of course, in the Reformation to our forebears. So this history is, it's not history. At every point in the history of the church, somewhere, the church is being persecuted, the body of Christ is being persecuted. I mean, the per there's also persecution outside the Middle East at the moment, places like Nigeria, uh, where there's an extreme persecution going on. Do, do you see a bigger picture 
uh, in your, in, through, your, through your priestly ministry? Do you, do you see, see forces at work in this persecution? Certainly, because one of the most important forces is the fact that the information is not being conveyed by the mainstream media. There's virtually never a report about the persecution of Christians. For example, I'm sure most of our viewers and listeners don't know that in the last three to five years, more Christians have been killed in Nigeria than the entire number of Christians killed by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Thousands of Christians have been killed. Black Christians, men, women, children, murdered, uh, heads chopped off, their houses burned down, burned alive in churches. This is all happening, and it's happening across the globe. Christ himself is being persecuted. I always say when I give talks, when we remember the journey of Paul to Damascus, the Lord knocked Paul, Saul as he was, off his horse, and Saul said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, and you are persecuting me. He didn't say my followers, he didn't say my church, he said me. Where the church is being persecuted, Christ himself is being persecuted, which is why it's so important that Christians, Catholics, believers, have a care and concern about the persecuted church. It's not something we can push to the side and maybe pray about once or twice at Mass every couple of weeks. Or This has got to be a part of our prayer intention and our spiritual life, that our brethren are being persecuted. I mean, we're roughly the same age, and when we were growing up, um there was talk of persecuting Christians behind the Iron Curtain, you probably remember. Uh, but it was a kind of a low-level persecution. It was, ha it was a sort of hassling of people as they went to church or suppressing certain things. But is it right, in, am I right in thinking that in our lifetime this, this persecution has accelerated at a rate that we could never have imagined and to a scale of ferocity that we could never have imagined? And this is particularly, unfortunately, again, the rise of radical Islam, because we must remember that it's not all Islam. We can live in peace with many, many Muslims, but radical Islam, yes, it's, there, there is only one choice, really. It, it is convert or die, or leave. So it's three choices in a way. But normally it is convert or die. There's no middle ground. For example, one of the towns I visited in Iraq, ISIS actually dug the bodies of Christians up out of the graveyard. And I remember asking the priest, what, why did they dig the bodies up? Even in death, the Christians were not safe. Even their bodies were not safe. And the priest said, well, because they're trying to eradicate the memory. They're trying to pretend, in a way, that Christianity never existed. And yet, of course, Christianity was there before Islam. As I said at the beginning, it is the Holy Land. It's the land of Christ and the, the Holy Land of his saints long before the time of Muhammad and Islam. So yes, the ferocity is rising, and yet, at the same time, the mainstream media is ignoring. There's something peculiar about that. Have you spoken to anybody in, say, the State Department or, or even the Foreign Office here about this? Have you tried to speak to politicians and say, why aren't you speaking out against this? Yes, that's part of the advocacy work, and that's what many of the organizations are doing. And uh, um, there, there's some response, but it's very difficult. There's always an uphill task. And what do you think that is? That's a very difficult question. Uh, again, I suppose, because we're not really Christian in the West anymore. Uh, the, one, the one exception, f funnily enough, we are speaking here in Walsingham on the feast of St. Stephen of Hungary. And the government of Hungary is the only country in the entire world that has a government ministry dedicated to persecuted Christians. The government of Hungary decided that this was so serious, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary in 2016 decided he would create a ministry specifically for persecuted Christians. And thank God that is beginning to inspire other governments, but it's because Hungary really proudly claims to be a Christian nation. We're, we're a little bit scared often now in the West of, of even saying we're a Christian nation. Sometimes we even deny that we're Christian nations. I think you're probably right. I think, I think at the, 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 the base of the, the lack of the indifference on, on this subject is the, the idea that this ha is happening far, far away and uh, we live in a very secular society which doesn't quite understand why people are getting so upset about religion. Um, but is your charitable endeavours partly to educate the West about this? I mean, it, it is advocacy, I know that, and it's talking to people of influence to try to help and aid the Christians. But is there an educational aspect to it Very as well? Very much. Uh, in fact, it's almost principle, and it is 
in a way, principally to educate, as it were, our own, yeah. our own people. Whenever I go to parishes, uh, particularly in the United States, people respond wonderfully. I mean, they're, they're, they're touched, they're hurt, they're, they're, they're sorrowful. But one of the things they say continually is, we don't know this. We don't know anything about this. We don't hear anything about it. As I said already from the mainstream media, they don't hear. But sadly, they don't hear from many of their bishops, their priests, that this is something that's away. Or they say, well, it's all over, isn't it? ISIS has been defeated. ISIS is just a name. There's a baby ISIS, there's a new ISIS. It's just a name for, for the doctrine. And so, uh, and it's not, as I said, it's not just radical Islam. For example, in India, massive persecution is from Hindu extremism. Uh, secu extreme secularism is, is persecuting. Uh, we know about China, for example, communism, as you spoke about before in, the, in Eastern Europe, but communism is persecuting violently Christians. So education is critical. This is not something from the past. This is, this is massive and almost overwhelming. You said there that uh, you, you, you know, people in the parishes in the States were saying, we well, don't know this, and priests were, 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 were also similarly probably scratching their heads. I mean, have, have you met with bishops? Have you met with priests? Have you spoken to them about this? And, and if so, what's the kind of reaction you're getting from? Well, I think, yes, I have. And one of the things I try to do is give, as I said earlier, is try to get people inspired and to try to think about praying and but I, the word I always use is passion for the persecutor you have to have a passion for example me going for the first time if you go somewhere like that to Iraq or Syria and you don't get touched uh, by this then it's hard to say how you can have the name of Christian and s similarly I mean the trouble is many of our bishops and priests are they're busy people and normal Christians, Catholics are busy people, they've got lots going on in their lives and they, they feel bad but then they think well you know I've got to get back to earning my living and everything. That's why I always say the spiritual component is critical. Prayer is so important. Prayer is not a last resort, prayer is a first resort. So when we say, sometimes we say well we have to pray for the persecuted and people say yes well what, then what should we do? You're doing something already. When I've been in Iraq and Syria the very first thing they ask for is prayer. Please pray for us. In fact, when I was in Damascus last year, the Archbishop said to me, when I said, well, what can I say to the people in America and in England? He said, please first pray for us. I said, Archbishop, sometimes even that doesn't happen. He said, that's why I said first, please pray for us. If we are not praying every day, at least a Hail Mary for the persecuted, for the rest of our lives, not for two years, for the rest of our lives, we're, we're doing something wrong, we're missing out. So prayer is critical. And then all the other things flow from it. Prayer inspires action. But prayer is not a sort of coward's way out of doing nothing. It's critical. How has this changed you? <laughs> well, I gave up being a parish priest. I was quite happy in my parish. Uh, I've been a priest 26 years nearly. Um, I, I, was, I said to someone the other day, if you told me in June of 2014 that within seven or eight months I'd be in Iraq, I'd say, why would I go to Iraq? And let alone give up my parish and, and spend a couple of several years with no salary. And I'm not saying that to have people weeping and wailing and sending me checks, although a check would be very nice. Um, but uh, uh, it's a call. The Lord, the Lord, within three times I've heard uh, from, from people, including one in Iraq, you have a call within a call. You have a vocation within, a, I have a vocation to be a priest, but my priesthood now is to aid and advocate for the persecuted, which is a kind of a unique, uh, it doesn't sort of fit into the slot. But I was a parish priest for the majority of my priesthood, and, and I still love that, helping in a parish, but, so that's how it's changed me, that, that, that my life has to, I have to do this, I, otherwise I, I will not be able to meet the Lord and, and at least I can say to the Lord, I tried to do my little bit, small as it is. We're meeting in Walsingham, which is quite unique as a Marian shrine because it has both a Catholic shrine and, a, and an Anglican shrine. And I know your own journey has been from Anglicanism to Catholicism. Well, it's a 
fairly swift journey from Anglic. I was an, uh, an Anglican as a boy, mm -hmm. and then was became a Catholic. And uh, yes, it's led me finally to being a member of the Ordinaria, that beautiful group within the church that has a lot of Anglican tradition. Um, but yes, to be in Walsingham is just a, a joy, and the place of Our Lady in all of this, as well as I mentioned earlier, uh, being inspired during the by praying the Rosary. Our Lady, Our Lady has a special place with that title, Our Lady Help of Christians. I mean, that's such a powerful title of Our Lady. It's not just helping Christians uh, personally, morally or whatever, but Our Lady Help of Christians. We know she's, she's turned back armies. She, she's defeated armies, Our Lady Help of Christians. So she's very, very central in this whole endeavor. You, you've recently become a priest of the Ordinariat. I think, is, is it a year? About a year, yeah. About a year. Um, how, did that, how did that change come about? I was very blessed. Um, as I said, I had been an... It's a, it's a rather weird story. My parents... I was baptized a Catholic. My parents left the church. So I went to an Anglican school. I went through the Anglican sort of run-of-the-mill stuff. I was confirmed as an Anglican. And so in God's providence, what was a, a mistake 40-plus years ago, um, I needed to find a spiritual home as a priest because um, not every bishop wants to give up one of his priests because we need parish priests, yeah. but um, through God's providence, uh, I was led to the Ordinariat and the Ordinary here in, in England uh, accepted me and blessed this ministry. And so that's why I'm, well, I'm sometimes here in England, but also mainly based in the USA, back and forth. But I can do this ministry full time. But, but the Lord has blessed me with that, with, that, with that grace, really. Do you see parallels between your ministry in England as an ordinary priest, or when the, the ordinary ministry in England, and your ministry to the persecuted Christians, you know, is there? The, the, b b both are working with um, hostile opposition of various sorts, and manifested in radically different ways. I grant you, but do, do you see that the, the ordinary is playing its part in 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 almost bringing bringing the Catholic Church back into the English mainstream in a way that what you're trying to do and replacing the Nineveh plain with its original Christian inhabitants. One would hope that uh, we can do that. I, I remember last year Cardinal Vincent Nichols preaching actually at the anniversary, the 10 year anniversary of the Ordinariat, um, beautifully said that one of the gifts the Ordinariat can give to the English church is reminding English Catholics of their heritage, but also particularly the, the pre-Reformation saints. And so it is a beautiful thing to, to remind people of English spirituality, and especially for us being here in Walsingham, a reminder of the English martyrs. So there is that link because, again, especially in the United States, for example, ma many, if not most Catholics, don't really know anything about the English martyrs. They, they might know about St. Thomas More, perhaps, but to remind English Catholics, they, they sing Faith of Our Fathers, I think, uh, but they don't really know why they're singing Faith of Our Fathers. The Dungeon, Fire and Sword is all about us. And so it's very, very important. To, and it's such an inspiration. Again, the English martyrs, uh, when we tell stories about the English martyrs, apart from the humor, uh, it's one of the great gifts, I think, of the English martyrs, that, that how humorous they were. But such an inspiration, again, men, women, children, we presume, and there are no canonized saints, I don't think, uh, uh, children, but these inspirational figures, priests, lay people, not many bishops, but that's another story. If somebody was watching this tonight or today somewhere in the United States and wanted to, to help in practical terms, obviously financial terms, but in practical terms, how do they go about it? Well, as I said first, first and foremost, pray. Promise, commit to pray for the persecuted even that one Hail Mary, first and foremost. Advocacy themselves, I mean, everyone who's a voter can advocate. They can ask their senator, their MP here in England, whoever, why, why are uh, the persecuted not being helped? What are you doing? How are you, how are you assisting them? That's practical. As I said, most, we try as hard as we can to get most of the money to help these, these families individually to start. So it's very, very small. I, I stress that again and again. But, but in a way, that's a blessing because people can almost follow. If you go to the website, you can almost see, as it were, where the money's going. These big, and I'm not denigrating any of the big charities. I know many of them have helped wonderfully, but people kind of like a sense that, I mean, the charity's not building me a jacuzzi, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm living, this is, 
that's me. I'm the charity, basically, and then hopefully everything else goes to, to help. So it's, it's small but beautiful. So at the moment, it's, uh, it's a US-based charity. Yes. Are, there, are there any plans to set up here in the UK? Yes, we are right actually in the middle of that now, and hopefully within, within possibly weeks, it will be a, a UK charity as well, which is easier for, for donors as well in the, in the United Kingdom. So between the United States and the United Kingdom, um, there'll be two, uh, as it were, separate charities, but doing the same thing. And I'm assuming that you're available to parishes, to dioceses, to... Uh... Only if they give vast amounts of money when I, when I come to speak. No, just kidding. Yes, that's my job. Yes. That's my job to yes. do that. So you must do a lot of travelling as well. I was until, of course, this terrible coronavirus, and which has been a, another spiritual component of this tragedy that's stopping, I mean, l quite literally stopping my ability. Last year I was traveling a vast amount, and, but this year already I haven't been able to go to Iraq. I was meant to go twice and I haven't been able to go and still not able to go. So it's, um, it's very, that's very disturbing. And who is the patron? Who's the spiritual patron of your charity? The spiritual, I thought you actually meant the patron, because we have a very wonderful patron, His Eminence Cardinal Burke, just a few weeks ago agreed to be the patron oh, of our charity, which is a tremendous blessing. Um, but the spiritual patron is Our Lady. Our Lady of Sednaya, which is a shrine in um, Syria, very ancient shrine, allegedly possibly the icon of Our Lady of Sednaya is allegedly one of the icons painted by St. Luke. I mean, one can argue whether it is or not, but it's a, mir it's a miraculous icon. It's been there for centuries and centuries. And under that title, Our Lady of Sednaya, she is Our Lady Help of Christians. And so she is the, the patron. And we have a few other patrons as well, but she's the, she's the boss. Wonderful. Father Benedict, thank you so much for taking the time on your busy schedule here in England, on your visit here to, to, to visit us here in Walsingham and EWTN and to speak to us about these persecuted Christians. It's, a, it's an absolute central to our faith, as you've said, and anybody watching this can, can go to your website and help you in your mission to help the persecuted Christians, particularly in Iraq. And on behalf of all our viewers here in Great Britain, I'd like to thank you for the work you've done for the persecuted Christians, and uh, I do hope you come back and visit us again. Happily, Kevin, and thank you to you, but also to, uh, to AWTN. They've been very supportive through these years, so I'm very grateful and, and wish God's blessing upon all those who support EWTN. Thank you.